another daily Sabbath school lesson review. And today's the Friday edition when we take all the questions. We only had one question this week. Very interesting, interesting question coming in from a listener. But we'll take that and then we'll go into the lesson, the questions from today's lesson. Those things that we should have been able to discover and realize in our study this week. Here to help us with our lesson today is Pastor Orville Joseph. Good morning, Pastor Joseph. Good morning, good morning. Well, this morning, I'm just going to invite you to tell a friend, share the link with a friend, or tell a, uh, invite a friend, say, Whispering Hope is on. We're happy to have you join it every morning, getting up out of your bed. And even in your busy schedule, you make our study a part of your day. We're happy to have you joining us. And so today we're going to go into a study. We are looking at the stranger in your gates. That's the study for this week. But before we go into our study today, we're going to have our memory text and we'll have a prayer by Pastor Joseph. And I will read to you your memory text. Your memory text for this week is taken from Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 19. And it states, Therefore, love the stranger. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Okay, let us pray, Almighty God, our loving Heavenly Father. We are delighted that you have given us the opportunity to see another day. We are thankful for your mercies, for your grace, and for your covering of our lives. And this morning, we ask that your Holy Spirit will be with us as we study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Pastor, we move right into a question. We only had one question from our audience this week. They were quite pleased with the presentation of the lesson study. And they're only saying amen, hallelujah, and Lord help us. In most cases, it seemed like they recognized that we needed some reform in our lives or that circumcision of the heart as the way the lesson started this week. And the question is, if Jesus was here among us in human flesh, that is, like when he was a, a walking among the disciples, how do you believe he would have treated the unvaccinated? Jesus' concern would always be for the health, welfare, well-being of the individual. Jesus is a champion for the outcast. Um, Jesus is a champion for those who are in need of help, compassion, um, salvation. And so Jesus is always open and embracing to the marginalized. And so if perchance the, the, the unvaccinated, um, and I suspect that that might be the trend of thought of the individual, that perhaps the unvaccinated is marginalized, looked down on um, uh, being a source of suspect. I, I think Jesus would embrace them, would, 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 would seek to work with them so that, you know, the best can happen for them. I, I think in, in Jesus' life, he has always displayed a, a concern for those who, who did not have anybody to champion their cause. I, I think one of the things that I, I really would want to also mention in regard to this particular question is, is the fact that Jesus recognized the, the, the responsibility authority has with regards to health. And I, I'm speaking specifically as it relates to health now. And even though those who are outside of the, even though those who are outside of the mainstream, and I'm specifically referencing right now the, um, the leper who was cleansed. When Jesus asked him to go show yourself to the priest, in other words, go and verify with the priest that it is all right for you now to be a part of society once again. You know, Jesus is not the kind of person who divides society or divide groups or divide the church merely because we do not all make the same decision at the same time, but he works with individual where they are to bring them where he wants them to be. Uh, and I believe that's the way he would have 
related to the unvaccinated. Okay, well, I couldn't ask you the follow-up question because I've not known of any church who have indicated they will not worship with the unvaccinated. So maybe we'll have a question like that later on. Never know how things develop. But for now, well, well, I, I, <laughs> well, one thing I can one thing I can assure you is that the that, that the Assembly Adventist Church will always be open to individuals from every creed, race, class. The, the church will always be open to them. So whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated, the church will always be open to you. And I think one thing that you could say with regards to the church is that the church has a high level of compassion for individuals who are lesser fortunate. However, I think it is important for us to understand, and I, I go back to the, to the example that I used earlier on, where there are laws and there are health guidelines that needs to be followed. Those are not to be flaunted. Uh, those are, are to be respected. And I think that was a point that Jesus made also when he asked that the, the, the man to go show himself to the priest. That is to recognize that there is a there is a responsibility on the part of society to offer for good health and for the protection of others. And so one cannot say that because I am a Christian and I have chicken pox that I can just go and associate with anybody because God will protect them and everything will be all right or it must be accepted. I think we ought to be responsible in terms of how we live our lives and that is what exactly what Jesus would have wanted. In today's lesson, Pastor, the author said, it's hard to imagine that in the best times under the reign of David and Solomon, Zul, that people oppressed the poor and then he or she referenced Amos chapter 5 verse 11. Pastor, is it any different in this COVID-19 pandemic and what should be the response of the just? So I'm going to read from Amos and it says, Therefore, because you shed down the poor and take grain taxes from him, though you have built houses of hewn stone, yet you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink wine from them. For I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins, afflicting the just and taking bribes, diverting the poor from justice at the gate. And that's it was 5, 11. And 5, verse 11. Okay, so... Uh, what I would say is that there are still pockets of individuals who are still oppressing the poor, still not giving people their rightful wage, um, still trying to help people live from hand to mouth, still not rewarding people as they should. Uh, there are still people who are not granting people the justice that they deserve. But, but I think one of the things that we should try to hide away from is to use Amos appeal and call um, as a blanket meaning that because Amos says it's happening, everybody's doing it, right? Uh, and, and so we condemn the church, saying that the church is oppressing, taking from the poor to, to uh, and not helping the poor. Or we condemn the government, saying that the government is taking um, but not doing this or that. What I'm saying, wherever injustice, oppression, uh, slavery, the subverting of, of, of justice, wherever that takes place, it must be condemned. It must be condemned by, by leaders. It must be condemned by the church. It must be condemned by men of goodwill. And so that should not be that should not be encouraged at all. I think one of the things that when we look at Amos, we need to ask ourselves the question: how are we treating other people? 
how, how do we regard them? Are we paying people their honest wage when somebody shows up to cut my lawn? Um, do I just give him something because he is in need or he's begging and therefore, whereas I would have paid a contractor $500 to cut my lawn because this is a guy that's just on the side of the road and I can just toss a $20 on him to do the very same work. And I'm saying that the call of Amos is for us to be just in our dealings with people. The call of Amos is for us not to undermine individuals or, or, or to oppress individuals or to misuse individuals. The call of Amos is for us to act justly with everyone. Um, if, if somebody does uh, fear work, they should get fear pain. Uh, that should be across the board. And it doesn't matter who it is. People should always receive their just reward. That is the plea. And the plea is for us as individuals, as it, as it is for institutions and governments. You know, uh, I don't know if it's fortunate or unfortunate that we live in a state where governments are elected in, the, in Amos' time. They were monarchies. People didn't have much say as to who become leaders. But today we have the choice of, of electing our leaders. We can replace them every five years if they don't act the way we think they should act. But even in the midst of that, People are mistreated still. Even in the midst of that, people are in an unconscionable way. Government still tax people in a way that, that they should not be taxed. Or, uh, the tax burden is might be greater um, on people and even more, more vulnerable uh, are expected to pay the same kind of tax as others. And so some people see what we call VAT or um, ABST uh, as... As, an, as one of those kind of tax, because whether you're rich or whether you're poor, you pay the same kind of tax as everybody else. You know, and, and that some people might find to be a way of going after the poor rather than trying to alleviate the suffering, the pain they are facing in society. So, yes, the message of Amos is real and true. There are still pockets of, of individuals who are suffering. And even those of us who work at, at certain jobs, we, we might be in those jobs, but because of certain conditions, because government wants to do this and spend money on this, then they're not raising the, 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 the wage to be consistent with the kind of work that people are putting out. And you work at a hybrid firm, and because the, the owner, uh, the proprietor wants to build up a bigger account, he doesn't share the benefits and beauty of the of the business with his employees. Uh, you know, those are things that still continues to happen. And, and there ought to be a voice that says that all men ought to be treated equally. Pastor, we're going into our first question. I think it is a three-part question. And the discussion question it says, Israel needed to remember they had they had been strangers in Egypt, which was one reason they were to cheat strangers and outcasts in Israel as they wish they had been cheated when they were outcast. And you could put it in our context today. We were once outcast too and having difficulties, living in a life of sin, but Christ gave his life for us. We accepted the call, gave our lives to him. We should not feel superior. What are your thoughts? Exactly. You know, I, I agree with those thoughts. Israel should have remembered remember the pain, the frustration, the anguish, the burden that they were placed on that. Israel should have remembered how they cried out from the taskmasters. Israel should have remembered how they were humiliated and, and, and downpressed. And as such, should be able to feel the pain and anguish that comes from being strangers, from being outcast, from being under the yoke of slavery and from being trodden down, they should understand that and be empathetic or sympathetic with those who are going through the same and be prepared to, live, to, to, to lend a hand that lifts those individuals to a higher level, not treat them the same because they understand what it feels like to be to be treated that way. Even those of us, sometimes in the church, we, we were all kind of vagabonds when we were in the world. And no, 
all that we have been saved and been brought into the church of God and been clothed with our white robes, we, we have this attitude of, of just downright rejection and, and abhorrence of, of those who are involved, are, are involved in the same thing that we were involved in. We don't want to see them. We don't want to talk to them. We don't want to keep company with them. And they, they're, all, they're just so despicable. But, but, but we should remember that we were, as a matter of fact, Peter in Second Peter 9 and 10 reminds us that we were the same as those and that we were not anything special by God chose us, but, but, but that God called us um, to clean us up, to, to cover us with his righteousness, to give us the white right robe so that we can go out and see somebody who are in the same condition as we were and say to them, hey, listen. God can do the same for you. We need to have that kind of attitude. And I'm saying that as a church, we are not, as a people, we are not motivated. to. We, we have this disdain for individuals who find themselves in the same position that we were in. And merely because we have been elevated and, and celebrated that no longer we can, we are able to stand the stench or the look of these individuals. And God is saying, no, that's not who I've called you to be. Follow up question, Pastor. It says, How does this truth relate to the gospel, to the idea that through the blood of Jesus we have been freed from slavery of sin, the slavery of sin? Well, again, through the blood of Jesus we have been set free. Um, and the blood of Jesus is still there to set others free. For, we ought to build like those folks in the in America. We ought to build an underground railroad where we're able to snatch individuals who are in slavery and bring them to freedom. We need to have that kind of um, mentality where everybody that we see trapped in sin, everybody who we see being humiliated by sin, everybody who we see being pressed down by sin. We need to have, as I said, that we will do everything we can, even risk our own life, in order to free them from the bondage of sin. Let us move on to another question, Pastor. It says, think about it. We can worship on the right day and understand the truth about death, hell, and the mark of the beast, and so forth. That's fine. But what does it all mean if we cheat others nastily or oppress the weak among us or we don't administer justice fairly when we need to judge in a situation? Jesus makes it abundant clear, Matthew 24. That, that would be a passage that sticks in all our, our minds. But when it comes, when it comes, and he is separating those who are going to be um, in heaven or in hell, he is going to say, in as much as you have done it unto the least of these. It is how we treat, in the final summation, it is how we treat others that will determine our eternal existence. It is not the laws that we have written. It is not the fact that we know so much about the, the, the mark of the beast. It is not so much that we can um, talk fluently about what God is or dressed up in a kind of way or have others think that we are so fine and dandy. The way we treat others in the final analysis, Jesus says, in as much as you have done it to the least of these, you have done it unto me. And he said, come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. That's the essence of the gospel. And also, Paul, again, I keep referring this text in, in, in Philippians where the, the apostle Paul says that we have to have the mindset of Jesus in that he did not think that heaven was something to hold on to, but gave it up in order to save us. In, in other words, we ought to be so conscious about helping others that we should be prepared to risk it all to save them. Pastor, I look at our next question. It says, especially because of the truth that we have, why must we be extra careful not to think that somehow just knowing the truth in and of itself is all that God 
requires of us. And I, I love this question because as we looked at the lesson this week and we spoke about we are supposed to be treating others as God cheats us or Jesus cheats us. And then it spoke of one aspect that there was a text in the lesson this week in Deuteronomy saying that you should not go into the poor like courts and all these other and take what the person had for you because they are your brother. And they said we are taking it literally and if you want people to take advantage of them. But in the light of this question, I find this question important because if we are unwilling to do what God is required of us, then knowing the gospel and what God has done for us isn't sufficient. Your thoughts? Yeah, again, sometimes we, we, we misapply a few things. In John 8, 22, Jesus says, you shall know the truth, the truth shall set you free. And what Jesus is talking about is that you will, you will know Jesus, you will, you will have a relationship with him, you will be entwined, wrapped up with him, he will impact the way you live your life. Uh, that, that's the way it is. Um, I, I think it's Hosea, um, Hosea 4, that, that says, my people are destroyed for a lot of knowledge. And people think it is, it is, it is, it is knowledge, it is knowledge about the, the, the etc. But God is talking about that people are destroyed because they don't have an intimate relationship with me. They do not know me to the extent that they really should know me. And, and so just having book knowledge, as, as some people would say, just knowing what is in the Bible and, and not applying it to your life, not applying it, not allowing it to change how you see people, not a, a, a allowing it all to change how you see God, not a, a allowing it to change how you behave to others. Um, it, it, it is of no significance because in the final analysis, the, the truth that really matters is a truth that moves the individual to act as God would act. So then, Pastor, why is this dangerous? Because it seems to suggest that not knowing is not enough. Why is that a potentially dangerous trap for us? Yeah, because, because people think that because they know a lot about God, because they're able to recite Bible passages, because they've been able to, in, in, to explain um, biblical prophecies, and, uh, and because they're able to quote texts here and there, that somehow that is satisfying. And that is not what it is all about. It is, yes, it is good to know all those things, but unless they impact how you behave, and we have seen it, that people who are who have acquired a certain degree of, of, of knowledge, um, that they are puffed up, they, they feel elevated, they feel different, they, see, they feel superior to others. We see that all the time. And that is the danger of, of, of thinking that, Hey, listen, because I know all these things about God, then I am God-fearing. Uh, you know, and that is, the, for me, is the danger. And so, Pastor, I'll ask you a follow-up question because I wanted to ask it earlier in the week when I had a guest, but I think I was running ahead of myself. The ruler went to Jesus. He professed to be a commandment-keeping person. But Jesus says, one thing thou lackest, go sell what thou hast, and give to the poor. So can we actually not only know the Bible, but be practice, practicing morality from uh, uh, the letter of the law, from the letter of the law, and still be in trouble based on our study of the lesson this week? So, so again, the original ruler, um, based on my, my understanding of the passage, seem to be suggesting that I, I know what I ought to do in terms of what the, the law says, the letter of the law says, but I do not know what I ought to do in terms of what the law expects of me. Uh, he lived his life believing that as long as he knew and acted in accordance with the commands, that that was all right. But it is clear from his encounter with Jesus that those commands were designed so that he would impact the lives of others. And so far as they did not, they, uh, and so far as they allowed him to feel a certain sense of, of self-fulfillment, but did not allow him 
to feel a sense of obligation to others. He was deceived. And, and that becomes the danger again. Because once you know the truth about who God is, and once you understand the principles that govern him and governs the relationship that you have with him, you are propelled. You are propelled. I, I prefer to say propelled than compelled. Um, but you are propelled to live out your life so that your life is a benefit, a beauty, a blessing, um, a, 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 a source of upliftment to those around you. The commandment is clear. God wants us to love him supremely, but he also wants us to love those around us the very same way, no matter what they Okay, so Pastor, what role should our faith have in helping us to understand what is common refer commonly referred to as human rights? Okay, so our faith should um, elevate us as believers to the pinnacle of recognizing the rights of individuals, the right to help, um, happiness, the, the pursuit of the goal, um, the, the right to be able to live a, a, according to the conscience, a, 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 the right to be able to follow the dictate of, of, of a conscience uh, and, and follow the dictate of God's word. We should be able to appreciate that because um, certainly God has, 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 has bequeathed to us uh, that right and that right should, we should allow that right to naturally flow out to others as well. In other words, our faith should teach us that we should regard others as we would want ourselves to be regarded. Um, that we should treat others the way we would want to be treated. That we should look on others the way we would want to be looked upon. That, that even though we are pressed down, um, that, that, that if we're in the gutter and we, uh, if we were there, we would have wanted somebody to give us a hand and lift us up. That is how we ought to treat people. Uh, uh, you know, um, see others from our own perspective, what we would like to happen to us, the rights that we would have liked people to respect in, in terms of the way we live our lives and give the same respect to others. I think that our faith um, compels us to do that. As you're about to give me your takeaway from this week's lesson, Pastor, your thoughts on J James 1.27 that says, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widow in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Okay, clearly, again, James is emphasizing the fact that as long that our religion ought to be, or help us to be concerned about the least of these, the fatherless, the widow, um, in their affliction, they should find solace in the fact that I am a Christian. Uh, they should find solace in the fact that there is an Adventist church in the village where they reside or on the street where they reside or in the neighborhood. Or they should find solace in the fact that, hey, listen, because Adventist exists, life will be different for me. That is important. But even as we do those, we ought to allow our lives to tell that we have an experience with Jesus Christ. So, so James kind of kind of flipped what we were talking about. Well, give us the other side of the coin. In other words, yes, it is not good enough to be a goody goody shoe, you know, righteous, righteous, but it is also good to minister to others and meet the needs of others. Both go together to make the full coin to give you the value of the coin. Your takeaway from the lesson this week. What was the lesson saying to us? Well, clearly the lesson is saying that we serve an awesome God, an awesome God who sees us in our condition and is willing to risk everything in order to reconcile us, to restore us to himself, and also to keep us in that secure relationship. The lesson is also saying to us this week 
that just as how God loves us, cares for us, protected us, shielded us, and delivered us, that God wants us to cooperate with him to allow others around us, our neighbors, our friends, our families, and to experience the same kind of love and protection and redemption that we would have experienced. Uh, it, the cry out for this, for, for me from this lesson is that just as I have been given an opportunity to experience life in its fullness and its beauty with Jesus Christ, there is somebody in my, in my sphere of influence that need to know that Jesus can do the same for them and allow, and I should allow myself to be a source of, of, of bringing them into contact with Jesus Christ. The, the other point that is that I should never ever forget that I was rejected, outcast, miserable, a sinner, wretched, naked, blind until Jesus found me. And so when I encounter anyone who has been in the same condition as I was, I should be open to ensure that they are elevated, that they are elevated to stand where I stand in a solid, rejoicing, comfortable relationship with God. So there we have it, our friends. And I like the section in the lesson this week that says, it's all but proverbial how the weak, the poor, the outcasts don't get the same kind of justice in most human courts as those with money and power and connections. It doesn't matter the country, the era, the culture, or how lofty the principles of justice and equity that are enshrined in the constitutions or laws or whatever. I hear the words of a former Seventh-day Adventist who became a social commentator saying, equal rights and justice. That's what our lesson is calling for this week, for us to be fair to everyone. Doesn't matter their status, their origin, their culture, their socio-economic condition, Treat everyone with respect. God bless you and have a wonderful day. And remember, wear your mask, exercise your physical distance, and always sanitize because COVID is real and the life you save may be yours or someone you truly love. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.